morning, everyone. I'm from Transit Wireless. Uh, Transit Wireless is very excited to be given the opportunity to be part of AppQuest. Both the MTA and uh, AT&T are very strong partners with Transit Wireless. Transit Wireless is the company that has partnered with the MTA to build the wireless system in the 110-year-old subway system. So there are 279 stations, and that number is increasing as we add the Second Avenue line. And we've got the contract to build out these stations for wireless systems, which includes all commercial cellular services, as well as Wi-Fi services as well. So we're bringing the next level of communications into the subway, so it was quite an easy fit for us to try and be part of the AppQuest contest, bringing additional wireless communications into that system. So uh, we personally, as Transit Wireless, have, have, have joined this uh, competition to bring beacon technology into the subway. At the moment, it's a trial service, obviously, because you know, the, how we roll out such a system in the subway is, you know, that's a, a next question, but we want this system to be uh, user-friendly for uh, the disabled and access uh, inability people. So that was the goal of this uh, joint venture with the MTA and AppQuest. So we've uh, currently set up beacons within the Grand Central Mezzanine, uh, two particular stations, which is the shuttle and then the 456, so there is beacon technology, approximately around 50 beacons inside this uh, area. And we're hoping that the developers come up with uh, exciting new ways to help people around that network. And then we can take this and take this into the thinking for the next level. So via Skype, we've got uh, the guys from uh, Nimble who uh, are partnering with us to provide the beacon technology. And they're probably the best people to give you a bit of an overview of the actual beacons themselves. So we'll throw over to, uh, uh, hopefully we've got the guys on the line now. Uh, can you hear us on the, on the Skype? Yes, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Absolutely. So do you want to give us just an overview of the technology and, and how the guys can uh, access that technology? So thank you. I'm Miko from Nimble Devices. And uh, I'll briefly go through the what our indoor navigation SDK provides, how to get started, and what the basic features are. So as an overview, uh, as Nathan mentioned, uh, we've got beacons on the station. In addition to that, we've got a data file where we've mapped out the, where the beacon locations and, and the station. They, these two, uh, together with our indoor guide framework, uh, will give you coordinates, triggers, and routes to your application. Uh, we can also use magnetometers, accelerometers, and gyros to improve that accuracy as you move around. From the SDK, you will receive uh, GPS-style coordinates, so it's not using the GPS. Uh, it's using the beacons to give you latitude, longitude, and altitude. The altitude is basically mapped to each floor. You can also get navigation uh, through as routes. Uh, we can, you can request, there's an API to request a route to a target. Uh, you can, the targets and the routes are marked into the, the data file. Uh, and you can even route between floors, so if you want to get to the platform from the shuttle area, uh, you can do that. There's also something called tri triggers, or known as geofences as well, which are off areas marked on the map, uh, which are basically when a user enters that area, the, there's a fallback to a delegate method, and when it exits, it's the same. We can also do beacon-based tri triggers, which is basically what, similar to what iBeacons provide. So proximity triggering only to a beacon rather than to a, uh, to a, to a location. All right, so the map data contains all the information required for the positioning, routing, and triggering. This means that with a, if there would be trouble with the Wi-Fi, which of course there won't be, uh, that the app would still continue working. Uh, so everything is, all the data can be contained in a single data file. Uh, the source format for that data file is a CAD file. Uh, we recommend draft site for editing that, uh, that, that data file. We've got, we provided some instructions, but right now uh, I think it's best to do so that we get suggestions from you and we can double check that there's no errors in the CAD file if you require changes to the data file. So the NDD stands for Nimble Devices Data. And that's just basically a compiled format uh, packed 
uh, all of the map, map data together with uh, a few lookup tables to make the positioning calculation quicker. Uh, for to initialize the framework, you basic it's quite simple. You basically set the delegate methods you want your callbacks to. You set the data file and you call start updates. You can find more details in the API reference as well as the getting started guide. Uh, once you've initialized, you will start getting positioning. Uh, the positioning delegate is called once per second with the new position. That's as easy as it is. Uh, the location is the same location object you'd get if you use the GPS. Uh, you can also get these zone triggers. Uh, each zone trigger has a uh, name and a numeric ID. So when a user enters a specific uh, zone, you can, your, your app can get a notification that did enter zone and did exit zone. So, and you can nest these so you can have uh, did enter mezzanine and did enter uh, like in front of elevator type of thing. You can also do routing with the library, so you can, uh, the routing is always done from the user's current position to a target position. Uh, for example, there could be a target called exit, which will be then the closest exit, or then there could be a target called, or, or the same target could also have a more specific name, like exit to Broadway, or maybe in this case, to 42nd Street. And uh, then you'll, if you route to that, you'll, it'll find that target and route to it. Uh, routes are also inside the ND as is everything else. Uh, there's an, uh, and if you need a list of the different targets within an NDD, you can get that by asking for the property targets. Uh, so once a route is calculated, you'll get an update with did complete routing. Uh, if the user veers off course, so they're further than about a few meters. Uh, yeah, a few meters from the, so that's a, few, uh, uh, let's say 10, Six 20 feet, feet from the route, uh, they get automatically rerouted, and this method is called again. So you can get, during routing, you can get multiple different complete routing calls. Um, you can also get the position as if the user followed the route perfectly which is usually what you see in car navigation and stuff like this, where it's basically snapped to the route instead of giving a, a real position estimate. This gives a much better uh, user experience when it looks like their position is perfectly on the route they're trying to walk. Uh, so a few do's and don'ts. Please use the zones and triggers. Uh, if you have, if you need data which is not currently available from the data file that we provide or, or transit wireless provide, please ask for that data to be included rather than go and implement geofencing based on coordinates yourself. Uh, if you do implement based on GPS coordinates, it'll be much more difficult to manage as your app gets scaled to different places and stations because you will have to then go back and re, uh, sort of recalculate all the GPS coordinates rather than managing it in a in a CAD file. Uh, and if you've got questions, please use the Google Groups. We'll be monitoring it and answering it uh, as best we can. So now, if you've got questions, please go ahead and ask. Yeah, so it's probably a good time to open to the floor. Uh, obviously, Miko is the expert in this, so please direct the questions to Miko, but I can help. So is there any particular questions? And uh, we'll see if Miko can hear them, obviously. For this trial period, can you talk about the coverage you have in Grand Central? The, 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 the PDF file is a little hard to read. Oh, okay, as in the physical area that we're covering? Yeah, what's covering? yeah so um, when, once you open it up, but essentially, I'm not sure how familiar you, you are with Grand Central. Uh, Grand Central is three different stations merged into one complex. Uh, the s shuttle station, which connects to Times Square, We've covered all of those platforms, and then there's a walkway that leads down to uh, the 456. So the mezzanine area of the 456, which connects to Metro North and connects to the street, is done as well. And then a small area of the 456 plat platforms are done, essentially around uh, around the uh, the escalator. Sorry, the elevator areas. I'm just to ask you about the consistency and the accuracy. Would it, for example, be accurate enough to guide uh, a blind person, you know, without putting them over a staircase or something in case of some error? You know, would you, would it be that good? 
Right. So the question, uh, Miko, you may answer this and I can add some as well. The question is the accuracy. Uh, Miko, you, you can probably give the, the answer to the accuracy of the system, but before you get to that, uh, look, obviously this is a trial uh, and the accuracy that Miko will describe is, is from a general environment. Uh, Miko will explain that in the subway environment things change slightly. So we are seeing a little bit of variation with the trains and things and, and part of the trial is we'll, we'll understand uh, how that will affect. So Miko, do you want to answer on the, the actual uh, proximity that you can work down to and then how's that working in the Grand Central area? Yes, so the Grand Central area is actually uh, quite a challenging area because you're talking about placing RF uh, transmitters on, on metal surfaces which and the entire station is basically clad in different metal areas. So it's been a challenge for us as well to get to our normal accuracy, which is about two to three meters. Uh, we've, we've seen that uh, sometimes the accuracy is not quite as good as it should be. Uh, we are working on that, but uh, in general, the, for a blind person, the most dangerous part is exactly what was described by E accidentally to falling down the stairs. Uh, I would not rely on any technology alone, uh, any single technology alone to, for, uh, for avoiding that. Uh, what I would say is though that it could be used to alert that it is, that the user is in a potentially dangerous zone, but blindly following navigations, whether it be car, car navigation or otherwise is, uh, has not, not has, as, as can be read from, read from the media, it's not always such a reliable technology. Oh, yeah. This still might be early, but can you talk a little bit about the actual hardware itself? Yeah, uh, can you actually, Mika, uh, describe the hardware that you're using? Sure, so we are using uh, small battery-powered beacons. They're Bluetooth 4.0 beacons. Uh, we're using them in a dual-purpose setup where they're used for, they're transmitting one packet type for the positioning, uh, library and then they're just transmitting standard iBeacon packets as well in case somebody wants to use standard iBeacons to, to, for their development. Yeah, so th this, just to emphasize, obviously this is a trial. When and if we move to a production type uh, uh, beacon, that's still open and how that would work. But obviously this, for the trial, that's the technology that's being used. Uh, at the back here. Yeah, for the Android uh, side of this, what's the what required operating system level and device for the device? I believe, and Miko will uh, correct me, but I don't think currently the system's Android capable, but that they're working towards that. Do you want to, Miko? Do you want to comment? We can provide a beta version of the Android stuff. Uh, we're not using, or we can't. With Android, we're not recommending to use the inertial sensors, which we use on iOS, because there's just a lot of differences between Android phones. Uh, we have a beta version, which does the Bluetooth positioning, uh, but with Android, like I mentioned earlier, there's differences between Android phones that we need to compensate for, and it hasn't been through the amount of testing the iOS portion has. For Android, the 4. API 4.3 introduced uh, Bluetooth support. So uh, for Android 4.3 and above, uh, there is a beta. Now, what's included then in the uh, in the developer kit that you get when you sign up? There's a couple of Android zip files. Okay, do you want to, uh, Miko, uh, the question is what's included in the uh, development kit that you get when you sign up for the AppQuest? Do, do you have those details? For the Android part or in general? There's two Android zip files. There's two Android zip files apparently. But is, is that for specifically the beacons or is that for AppQuest in general? I guess. I think, yeah. I think one is the zip file for the API documentation and the other one is for the AAR, which is the library that you'll include into your Android Studio project. Okay, so. That is, that is available then to try. Right. Yeah. Uh, the lady in the back. Yeah, do you have, so is this deck available for all of us, I imagine? Is it uh, this, this particular deck, uh, we will, Erica will, will be able to make, we've got a version of it, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to provide that by the uh, Beacon website, I would assume, Erica. And it'll be available on the AppQuest website. Yeah, link to any documentation on the hardware. 
right. along with the mapping of where all the beacons are. Yep, all that is part of the uh, development kit as well. So, um, Eric, what is the actual email address that they can contact if there is additional Go information? To the MTA appquest.com. There's a acceptance of terms just because there's um, you know MTA mapping information. So once you accept the terms, you get kicked out the whole kit with beacon information and how to use them and where they're located. Sorry, just one more. So to confirm, there's been more testing on the iOS platform. I believe so, Mika. There's more testing on the ISO currently than, than the Android. Android's like a beta version, correct? Yeah, correct. Uh, we weren't actually uh, committed, to, like we couldn't commit to being able to deliver a version for Android, but uh, based on the amount of interest we had, we'd, we'd sped it up and we do have something to, to give out to test and so forth, but uh, I would say yeah, the majority of the development has yeah. been on the Android, uh, focus, sorry, Apple focus platform. Focus for us, and I believe this hackathon is more iOS. Correct. For iOS or Android, how would an app in iOS or Android access this information? Does it need its Bluetooth switched on, or does it get it through local Wi-Fi, or does it get through uh, internet connection, or what? The, the question is, how, how does it get its information? And um, you need, the, the users will need their uh, Bluetooth turned on, so it is a Bluetooth interaction. So the, the, the nimble beacons work off a Bluetooth frequency or Bluetooth communication service. So in order for the apps to actually interact, they need the Bluetooth turned on. That would be quite heavy on the battery, wouldn't it? For, uh, to be honest, I can't answer that question. Miko, do you know the, the battery consumption when the Bluetooths are on? Uh, it's... The, bat the Bluetooth com power consumption when the, blue uh, the battery consumption when Bluetooth is on is uh, not very significant in general. Uh, however, on especially on Android, if you do leave the positioning running on the back in the background, it does consume the more through the use of the CPU for the positioning calculation. It does use the battery. So on Android, we recommend turning. The positioning off when you the app enters the background on iOS that's automatically handled so only when you're actively using the app does it consume uh, power any other questions are there any potential dead zones uh, as in coverage dead zones yeah, yeah look uh, there are Miko can has done a lot of walks through the area but uh, obviously we're not covering the entire station so there will be dead zones uh, just quickly Miko um, yeah, the system's only as accurate as you can see the I-beams, uh, and, and I'm not sure if you know how well Grand Central is, but there is a lot of I-beams, so there will be locations where the size of the accuracy increases and decreases. So I guess that's probably the last question. Um, any other questions we can feed afterwards, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mika, as well, for uh, joining us by Skype.